Hi, welcome to lecture four on TensorFlow for deep learning research. And in today's lecture, we are going to be covering word to vec word to vec is a really important concept in um, current NLP, which is based on deep learning. We are going to be looking at name scopes, and uh, we are going to be looking at how to visualize the various embeddings. So let's get going. As far as the overall structure of our model in TensorFlow, we looked at it in the earlier lecture. We define placeholders for our inputs and outputs. We define the weights and we went through an example of how to look at the dimensionality of the weight matrices. How do we want to define them? We define the actual inference model, right? That's the model. So in case of, let's say, linear regression, that would be y is equal to x w plus b which is uh, the bias term we define the loss function and uh, we instantiate an optimizer and we define the training op which is going to be optimizer dot minimize loss right so we did all that stuff in the lectures uh, before so once we set that part up then we are going to be running this training loop where uh, we are going to be first initializing the model parameters by calling the global initializer. And uh, then for each step, we are going to be inputting the training data using the session.run feed dict. And we are going to be calling the inference and computing the loss, adjusting model parameters. So the way you would do it is uh, you would have defined a training op, right? And you'll just call training op uh, multiple times and you will be inputting training data at the feed deck at that time. And then in turn, that op will uh, minimize loss. Loss will uh, call inference for uh, training, call, will call inference on the input x, calculate the parameters, calculate the predictions y, and then uh, this keeps on going for as long as you want, okay? Very simply put, word embeddings capture the semantic relationships between words. So when you want to have a neural network which takes words as input, as is the case in NLP, we need a way to represent those words. So words are strings, only things that our neural networks can take are actually numbers. So we need to come up with a way of representing words. And word embeddings are a proxy for words. And the whole idea is that we want to capture as much of the semantic relationship between various words as possible. And there is a whole model for learning that and that's what uh, we are going to be covering. What we want is that once we learn these various embeddings, and let's say we were to take a two-dimensional projection of a word such as France, what we want to see is that if we took a two-dimensional projection of other words like uh, Europe or China or uh, America, so these are all countries and uh, Intuitively, if these vectors are representative of what uh, of these different concepts like France or America or countries or China, then they should be kind of clustered together. And that's what uh, we see once we learn these word embeddings and then project them in onto our uh, two dimensional using a technique such as PC, etc. So neural nets are not the only way to learn these word embeddings. They're, this is one way of doing it, but uh, traditionally there is another way which just uses counting. And uh, the new way, the, the way that was uh, developed a few years ago is iteration based, right? So let's look into what the traditional way of doing this would have been. So let's say we have a very small corpus of uh, three sentences. I like uh, deep learning, I like NLP, I enjoy flying, 
and uh, actually all these three are true in my particular case. Then one way of uh, trying to come up with uh, potential vectors are, let's look at the entire vocabulary out here, right? So you just uh, list all the different tokens out here uh, on the horizontally and then vertically we do the same, okay? And now we see whether how many times like came after I, okay? So we see it came once, twice, so we put two out here. How many times did enjoy come after I? And it comes once and we do that. Deep, never, learning never. And that's how we fill up this entire matrix. Now, if you really think about it, then you might see that right here we have a good representation. So for each of these uh, words, we can use these vec uh, these columns or, or for that matter, these uh, rows as representing the various tokens. Like I like for enjoy, for example, this would be this entire row. So this can be used for f as embeddings. Now. There is a problem that these are huge because right here the vocabulary is very small, but you can imagine the vocabulary being uh, pretty large. And, and then if you have to carry this around everywhere, then it's going to be a problem in your compute, uh, memory requirements, etc., etc. Another thing is you'll, rec you'll see that there is a lot of uh, sparsity out here. Uh, most of these, wo most of these uh, entries are zero. So there are, uh, there are ways that you can use this and uh, you can reduce the dimensionality of uh, this matrix by techniques such as uh, SVD, Singular Value Decomposition. SVD or rather uh, truncated SVD can be used to find a low rank approximation of this co-occurrence uh, co matrix. When you take the SVD of the co-occurrence matrix, you will basically factorize the matrix into three matrices. And the first one would be U, the second would be sigma, and uh, the third would be the V to N, suppose. Now, uh, the U matrix out here would be the left singular values, and uh, the center matrix would be a diagonal matrix, which is which are going to be the singular values, and um, these are going to be ordered. So sigma one is going to be uh, larger than sigma two, and this is going to be ordered this way. And these are the right singular. Uh, the v's are the right singular uh, vectors. And if we take the first k of these, right? So instead of going full blast and taking the entire dimensionality, which in this case would be if uh, in this case x is uh, mod v by mod v, then this uh, u would be uh, mod v by uh, mod v, cardinality of uh, the vocabulary also. But uh, to find a low rank approximation, we want to take only the first k of these vectors, right? And uh, what that would give us that for each of these uh, words, so for example, <coughs> these are the words W1, W2, all the way to W mod V. Now, if you look at these vectors, which are just from the index zero to K minus one, so the K dimensional vectors, these would be a good representation of these words, okay? So we can do that, but the problem with uh, SVD is it's a, it's a very expensive operation. So in general, if we take a matrix X, which is uh, M by N, then the complexity of um, SVD is going to be about M square N. So whatever is the smaller one. So in this case, it would be mod v cubed. So if you take a vocabulary of, let's say, I don't know, 1 million words, we are looking at 10 to the power of 18. Um, so it's going to be a hugely complex operation to carry out the SVD to find these uh, low rank representations. Also, now if you were to add one more word in the vocabulary, you will have to re 
do the whole co-occurrence matrix and also redo the whole SVD. So you can see that that can be a very big problem, right? The other way that we can generate word vectors is by using iteration-based methods where we use a simple neural network to predict the context words. So there are two methods which uh, we will discuss here. One is the continuous bag of words and the second one is the skip gram. In continuous bag of words, what we are given are the context around the target word. So if the uh, size of the window is 2, then we will be given wt minus 2, which is the wt minus 1 cat and wt plus 1 sitting, wt plus 2 on, and we are supposed to go ahead and predict the center word. That's going to be the job for the training. In skipgram, which is very similar to continuous back of words, what we are given are uh, are the center words. So is is going to be given and we are supposed to predict the context words which if there is a window of two we are going to try and predict the cat and sitting on. So this is the task that uh, we are going to try and achieve using a simple neural network. So here's how we'll be learning the word vectors using the skip gram method out here. So Let's say we have a training corpus. So training corpus will have just text. Let's say it's Wikipedia, right? And uh, we will get all the words in the training corpus. And let's say that we end up getting uh, mod V words. That's the cardinality of the vocabulary. Now, each word will be represented as a one hot vector. So what that means is that we will have vectors of dimensionality cardinality of V. So let's say if this is 10,000, then uh, we will have uh, a 10,000 uh, element long vector and each position will represent the word, right? So for example, uh, A might be 100 zero, zero, uh, for the next 9,999 times and uh, such. So this is uh, how we are going to be initially starting with one hot vectors for each word. And we will have a weight matrix of uh, dimensionality, cardinality of V and some D. Now this D can be anything from let's say 25 to 1,000, right? But uh, usually D is much, much less than cardinality of V. And the whole idea is that we are going to be learning this uh, matrix W and each row of this U1, U2 up to UV is uh, going to give us a vector for each of the words. So let's see how we can accomplish this. We are going to be looking at this uh, great tutorial by Chris McCormick and uh, I'm going to be talking through some of the things that he's talking about in this tutorial for word to work The way we come up with training samples from, uh, from the text would be by first choosing a window size. So let's say in this example we are looking at a window size of 2 and then we are going to be moving a window over the text. So for example, the window starts here, the very first uh, word is the, and in skipgram, the whole idea is that we are given the center word and we are trying to predict the context around it, right? So when we start with the as the first context um, center word, then we are, the training samples are going to be the quick and the brown and we have those here now the window moves to quick and now the quick quick the quick brown quick fox becomes the next set of training samples and uh, we keep on doing that uh, and this goes through the entire text here's the task that uh, we'll train the neural network to do so given a specific word in the middle of the sentence, we will pick one random word from its context, right? And in the example, we are talking the context is of two words and we, we are going to pick up one word. 
and the network is going to find the probability that uh, any other word in our vocabulary is that nearby word. So this is uh, what it actually means. So let's say we are looking at uh, this example. The center word out here is brown and we pick one word from its context. Let's say we randomly pick jumps, right? So the network is going to tell us as to what the probability of any other word in the vocabulary is to be this particular word, which is jumps. To accomplish this, first we will define this W weight matrix. And this is actually what we are trying to learn. It has uh, the, the number of rows is uh, cardinality of V, the vocabulary size, and the number of columns is the dimensionality of the word vectors T. Okay? And uh, we, when we take any word, the, and we have already represented that as a one hot vector, when we multiply that with this matrix, we will get a particular row. So this is, let's say this was the word vector for, uh, this was the one hot vector for the word ants, right? And once we do this multiplication, we are going to get this particular row out. And this is something that is uh, going to be the word vector for ants. And we are going to be learning on that. And on the output side, we will have another matrix, which is, let's say, W dash. And uh, out here also, the dimensionality is the number of rows is, let's say, cardinality of V. And the uh, number of columns is uh, dimension D. What we are going to do is we are going to take the dot product of this word vector, which is ants word vector, the way we uh, were doing this. And we will just have a vector which is going to have a dot product of d with each of these vectors so d dot v1 d dot v2 d dot v3 up to d dot uh, v cardinality of v so v1 v2 up to v1 v2 all the way till v mod car, uh, cardinality they represent a different word in the vocabulary so when we take the dot products we are basically doing what we were trying to say earlier is trying to see the probability of each word in the vocabulary of being in the context of this word ants. And uh, the assumption is that uh, the words which are in the context of ants are going to have a higher dot product value. And then to change everything into a probability distribution, we just take the softmax uh, of this vector. So when we do that, we are going to do E raised to whatever the scalars are out here, D dot V, D V1, etc. And then we normalize it uh, with the summation of all these exponentials. And this gives us a probability distribution over the entire vocabulary. So the intuition is that if two different words have similar context, that is, they are usually surrounded by similar words, then for these two words, our model needs to output a very similar probability distribution, right? And one of the ways that the model can do that is the word vectors for these two different words are similar. If the word vectors are similar, then what we will get outputted on the output side of things, the probability distributions are going to be similar, which in effect means that if two words have uh, similar context, then the word vectors uh, that we learn, that the network learns for them are going to be similar. And that's uh, pretty much what we are trying to do out here. So if you take, for example, words such as intelligent and smart, very similar, and they would occur in similar contexts. So the word vectors that the network would learn for these two different words, I mean, from a, from a keyword perspective, these are different, but the word vectors would be very similar. In the basic word to vec model, we have a softmax in the output. So given a context, what we are trying to do, as we saw earlier, 
is uh, take a dot product of each of these um, output word vectors and uh, use softmax. Now, the problem is that uh, there is this term, which is a summation over the entire vocabulary. And this is computationally extremely expensive. To get over this problem of uh, a really high computational complexity, there are a couple approaches that are taken. So one of them is uh, just instead of the normal softmax, you can use uh, hierarchical softmax and um, you can look it up out uh, in the literature. There is a very good description on what hier hierarchical softmax does and uh, how it saves computational time. And then the others is a sample-based approach. So there are two ways in which um, there are two methods that we usually use. One is the negative sampling and the uh, other is the noise contrastive estimation. Both are kind of related to each other, but uh, the nice thing about NCE is that it uh, gives a theoretical guarantee that it will approximate the softmax that, uh, we are, that we were looking at, whereas the negative sampling doesn't. But uh, Practically speaking, it does not really make a big difference whether we use uh, negative sampling or NCE. So let's try to get a better intuition of what uh, NCE is. So just to recap, when we are using softmax in the output for our learning of the word vectors, what we are actually trying to do is to learn the probability of a certain word given the context. Right, so we start with a context word and uh, we are trying to learn the probability distribution over the entire vocabulary. And uh, the way we do out there is we just take the exponent of the dot products of the various parameters. But um, if you look at it more generally, it is just a function u theta w comma c out here basically means that uh, it is a model, we are using some parameter theta, in our case the word vectors are those parameters, and uh, then we take the summation over the entire vocabulary. So if we look at it in a general way, we are looking at, uh, there is, uh, we are trying to uh, get this uh, probability distribution and, uh, oh, and the parameters are theta, when, and uh, it is uh, some u theta, which is a function of uh, the context word and the vocabulary, and then there is this summation. So we replace this summation with a z theta, and that's also a function of c. So when we are training our neural net, we once we have a model for this uh, p theta w uh, given c, we will then take the cross entropy error and then the neural network will train. Now let's look at some definitions. So let's say that P tilde W comma C and P tilde C are the empirical distribution. So basically the way, um, uh, the way we define empirical distributions are that the there is we have the training data and uh, there is some distribution which is there, which is latent, that we are trying to learn and we are trying to approximate that using p theta w comma c, right? Because that is our job. When we are trying to learn and approximate softmax, basically the definition of softmax as we saw is, uh, is p theta w comma c, right? So given, uh, so the empirical distribution is something that uh, is there that is uh, that is distributing the training that is generating the training data that's the assumption but we cannot really get to that so all our all our job boils down to is to come up with a model with some parameters and our hope is that we are going to be able to approximate p tilde w comma c right Let's also define a noise distribution, QW, and uh, in practice, QW can just be the unigram model of the training data.
And we'll shortly see why we are defining uh, all these different uh, distributions. So NCE will reduce the language model estimation problem, which is trying to estimate uh, P theta WC, to, the, to a proxy problem of, uh, to a proxy binary classific uh, classification problem. And it uses the same parameters uh, that uh, we are using earlier to distinguish samples from this empirical distribution and uh, samples which are being generated uh, by the noise distribution QW. So for the two class training problem, this is how we are going to be generating the data. So remember, we already have the training data. We have those uh, context uh, words and the uh, windows, we, we have the center word, we have the context words, we, we have that entire training data in place already. So we will sample a center word from P tilde C and then we will sample one true sample from P tilde, P tilde W comma C. Now how do we do that? We already have the training data. So once we get a certain center word we look at our training data and then we see some sample which appears in the training data and that is our true sample because this is by definition generated by p tilde w comma c because it's part of the training sample okay and now we assign this uh, auxiliary and auxiliary label d is equal to 1 which shows that this data point is being drawn from the true distribution p tilde w comma c so that is, this is what we will do to get one sample with respect to the d is equal to one label. And then we will generate k noise samples. And uh, the way we will do is we already have qw, right? And we will just say that, okay, we will generate k different samples from that noise uh, distribution and we'll get k different words. And we will assign then the label d is equal to zero, which uh, indicating that these data points are noise. Again, we will first sample a center word from uh, the p tilde c. So let's say that is a sample word like fox, right? And uh, a true sample, which is also given where maybe the, there's a quick right? The word quick. Quick is in the context of fox. And uh, we will assign that D. And then we will generate K noise samples from Q, right? And this can be, uh, this is over the vocabulary. So we will come up with words like, let's say, I don't know, Trump or Clinton or whatever. And uh, now we will assign this, the auxiliary label D is equal to zero. Now, if we have to look at the joint probability of uh, d comma w in the two class data, it will be a mixture of two distributions. So, probability of d comma w given the context word is equal to if and this is two classes. So, let's look at the cla at, uh, class d is equal to zero when we are generating k samples from the noise distribution, right? And then there is a there is another sample from the two distributions. So total number of samples we are generating one plus k and k of them are noise corresponding to d is equal to zero. So k by k, uh, k plus one into qw. And similarly, when, for the case when d is equal to one, we have one by one plus k into, we are generating, taking that sample, which was the quick fox sample. We are taking it from the training set. So it's going to be p tilde w comma c. Now, using the definition of conditional probability, we can turn this into the conditional probability of D having observed W and C. And uh, for the two cases, when D is equal to zero, given uh, C and W, it's going to be this part divided by the sum of these two. So, okay, this is what we are seeing out here. And uh, for the other case, when D is equal to one, given the center uh, word and the words, uh, context words, this is going to be p tilde w comma c divided by this. 
At this point, we are still using the empirical distribution p tilde w comma c in our binary classifier. So that doesn't really help us because we don't really know that, right? So what we will do is, uh, as we said, that we are trying to learn the p tilde w comma c with uh, using this model distribution where, where we have some parameters. So we are going to go ahead and replace this with uh, p theta w comma c and the whole idea is that uh, we are going to choose theta. So the learning process is going to force us to get to a certain theta that maximizes the conditional likelihood of this proxy corpus that we just created. We can replace the p theta w comma c with uh, what we had talked about earlier, which is the u theta w comma c divided by the partition function. But uh, the problem still remains that uh, this partition function is really expensive to calculate. Now to solve this, what NC does is that uh, it proposes that the partition function zc be added as a parameter. So what, uh, what that means is, what we are going to do is that for every empirical context word that we are choosing, right, we are going to put in one parameter which is uh, zc and the whole idea would be to just uh, backprop through it and learn it as it goes. And some of the other research shows that if we just fix that zc is equal to 1 and not even worry about learning it for all c, let's just fix zc is equal to 1, we get uh, good results. So now if we make these two assumptions, which is uh, we are replacing the p tilde w comma c uh, by u theta w comma c divided by the partition function by zc and we are saying zc is equal to 1, then these two equations are going to reduce to these two, where p d is equal to zero, given the context and the uh, center is uh, k q w divided by u theta w comma c plus k into q w. At this point, we have a nicely framed binary classification problem with uh, parameters theta, which is the same parameters that we were trying to learn in softmax, but now this can be trained to maximize the conditional uh, likelihood of uh, D with K negative samples chosen. Now the objective to maximize the conditional log likelihood of D with respect to the K negative samples can be written as such. So basically we are just taking the log of for each, let's say we are talking about one sample, which is uh, the center word and the context. And uh, we look at the, the first term, which is uh, d is equal to one, which is simple log of uh, p d is equal to one uh, given c w. That is the objective that we are trying to maximize. For the second term, however, we have to, for each of these, the way we are doing the corpus is that for each of these uh, uh, center word, we are generating k noise samples, right? So what we will need to do is to get the expected log probability of producing a negative label out here and uh, under the noise distribution over all the words in V in the particular context C. And this is look, looking at just one uh, example. And so we still have to loop over the entire vocabulary to, to find this second term and that is problematic. Now for NCE, the additional thing that uh, we will be doing is to replace this expectation with the Monte Carlo expectation or a Monte Carlo approximation where we are going to just take the average of the uh, log pro probabilities for the k samples that we are choosing for that one particular uh, C. 
And the reason that uh, all this works is uh, easy to see if we take the derivative out here where uh, when you take the derivative of this objective, the derivative is equal to zero would be the uh, would be the point at which we'll be maximizing this uh, quantity. So, and when you look at the derivative of the of the objective, you see that this will get maximized. This will be zero when our model parameters, this our model, the p theta that um, and uh, which is equal to the u theta w comma c divided by z c. Remember z c we say it's going to be one. So this will this uh, objective will this the entire thing will be zero when uh, we learn to be close to the empirical distribution and that was the thing that we were trying to do in the first place. So in summary, NCE will reduce this language modeling objective that we have to a proxy binary classification problem and uh, what we are seeing out here is that uh, the objective will be realized at the same point for the model parameters. So to, to continue with the slides, we are going to be using NCE instead of negative sampling and uh, we already went into detail as to what the general intuition about uh, noise contrast estimation is. We went through the embedding lookup, how to find the various rows within the embedding matrix. This is the TensorFlow API for the NCE loss and um, we already went through that uh, when we were looking at the code. When you run the code that we went through earlier you'll see, and uh, then you TensorBoard the events, what you'll see is that the graph is very complicated. There are all these uh, nodes flying around everywhere and there is no clear separation around uh, what is the input, what is happening at uh, different stages, etc. So to remedy that, TensorFlow has this uh, great concept called Namescope and uh, this is what we are going to be talking about. Namescope allows us to group all the nodes together from the perspective of uh, namespace and uh, when you do that what will happen is uh, when you visualize everything using TensorBoard it will be very nicely se segregated so you'll see all these different nodes like radiance, loss, embedding, data and on TensorBoard you'll see a uh, a plus sign on the various nodes and when you go into that you'll see those uh, the various nodes within that so it's really useful for visualization. So what you do in TensorFlow is that um, you will create a namescope and the way you do that is by calling tf.namescope and you will give the name of the scope for example in our case the scope can have the name data or embed or loss and uh, once you create this namescope, what happens is that uh, TensorFlow returns this context manager when we call tf.namescope data and this and it pushes the namescope into the graph. So effectively what happens is now you have grouped together these various operations like center words and target words into the name space of uh, data and you can do the same with uh, the other groupings that you want to create like embed or loss and what we do out here is we create the name scope with uh, the name embed and then we are defining the variables and what happens internally when we do that is that uh, this name embed gets prefixed to the name of the actual variable. So the variable in the graph would then become embed slash embed underscore matrix. The variable out here would become loss slash embed. So that's how it's creating the, that scoping within the graph. Also you can nest the embeddings. Uh, I'm sorry you can also nest the name scopes. For example, in this case, if we have with tf.namescope embed 
and then we have embed metrics with which is in the scope of embed so that will become embed slash embed, uh, embed matrix but instead of starting here if we were to indent this with statement so that it is within the scope of this upper with statement what will happen you can still do this you can say with tf dot name scope loss and you can create these variables but now internally these variables in the graph would become embed slash loss slash embed and nc weight would become embed slash loss slash nc weight and uh, you can keep on embedding as deep as you'd like so now when we visualize everything using tensorboard what we'll find is that uh, all these things are very nicely grouped together so gradients so we created the data embed loss but if you want to dig deeper you can, um, there is a plus that will show up in the tensor board. When you go into that, it will give you all the details of the various variables which are within the name scope of loss. On tensor board, you will also notice that there are two different kinds of lines. One are these uh, solid lines and uh, the others are these dotted lines. So the solid lines are the data flow lines and uh, the dotted lines are the control dependencies edges so as uh, you might recall from before we talked about control dependencies in this case for example the embed variable can only be used after the init is called so these dotted lines show those control dependencies once we learn the word vectors we can now visualize these word vectors using a technique called tsne so tsne is a non linear dimensionality uh, reduction technique where we are able to take these high dimensional vectors which might be 128 dimensions or 300 dimensions or whatever but humans as humans we can pretty much only visualize two dimensional and three dimensional so it will reduce these high dimensional vectors into 2D and 3D with the effect that uh, the similar vectors are going to be projected uh, closer in this lower dimensional map. So when you, for example, look at the word American, uh, you'll see that its nearest neighbors are things like English, British, French. And uh, this is something that uh, you get by just looking at our word embeddings, the embedding matrix that we learned and um, plotting it using TSNE. Let's take a very quick look at the recipe for plotting the TSNE. So we will import projector from this uh, tensorboard.plugins, excuse me. Now, after the training is done, we will get a handle on the final embedding matrix. So the embed matrix is something that we had defined and as uh, we train the model, we, this matrix, the weights got changed and that is basically what we are trying to learn in the word 2 vec So we will get a handle to that. And uh, we are going to be creating a tf dot variable with uh, this final embedding matrix there take the first whatever number of vectors you want to print where you want to visualize and the way we created those um, embedding matrix when we were processing the data we were sorting it with respect to the frequency so the first 500 uh, in this case if we are trying to take the first 500 vectors they are going to be the most frequent uh, words and uh, we are going to create a tf dot variable, uh, get the initialization going on that. Now we are going to instantiate a config, uh, going ahead and uh, tf dot summary dot file writer in whatever directory you want to write. We are going to add the embeddings and uh, put in the name. We are going to get the actual names of the different words and uh, we are just go going to go ahead and straight away follow these instructions. This is just a recipe of 15, 20 lines of code that you can just cut and paste and uh, you will have your TSNE visualization. So that's that for word to vec and uh, hopefully you were able to get a little bit of intuition into why we want to learn word to vec 
and uh, a little more detail on what NCE is. Thanks a lot. I just realized that I somehow lost the whole segment where I was actually going over the code. So let's go over the code for the word to work model very quickly. So the code out here is really, really simple. All the complexity is basically kind of abstracted away by the TensorFlow, TensorFlow uh, API. So the vocabulary size is 50,000. We go with a batch size of 128. The embeddings we are learning are 128. The context is going to be one and num samples is uh, 64. That's the negative uh, samples that we are going to be sampling during uh, the NCE loss. Learning rate one, 10,000 training steps and uh, this is just for reporting. So when we look at the model, the first thing we are doing out here is to go ahead and uh, we are defining the placeholders for the input and output. So center words in skipgram, again, we get the center words and the target words and this uh, in conjunction will define our training set so the center words would be uh, integers, shape is of batch size, and similarly the target words are integers and the shape is batch size. So the way we usually process everything in for deep learning in NLP is uh, when we process the input text, we are going to be reading in all the words and we are going to be assigning indexes to them. So let's say, the word the has an index of zero uh, and and so on. There will be like 50, if the vocabulary size is 50,000, there will be like, like 50,000 indexes, right? So this is, the, this is the input part of things. Now we define the embedding matrix. So remember embedding matrix is what we are interested in as far as uh, the word to work model is concerned. So it will have vocabulary size number of rows and embedding size is the columns, right? So for each of the words, uh, we are going to be learning a embed size dimensional word vector. So this is what this represents and this is just initialization. Now the inference in six, uh, skipgram is basically we are just looking up the center word. So like it's kind of uh, useful to just focus on one word. So even though center words is like the whole batch, let's just uh, look at the first word and just run through the code using that in our mind so that it's easier to visualize. And the fact that there's a batch size just does the same thing for everything which is part of the batch. But for understanding, let's just say that there is one word out here and uh, when we do the tf.nn.embedding lookup using the embedding matrix with that word, we are going to get that uh, uh, word vector for that particular word. And we went through that uh, before, right? So from this, we are going to abstract the row which is corresponding to that word. And hence that row is the word vector for that particular word. Now, uh, in the next step, we are going to be constructing the variables for the NCE loss. The NC weight is again going to be, this is the output matrix. So we will have the vocab size and embed size again. And uh, this is just initialization stuff. Bias is going to be the vocab stuff. This is um, the usual fare. Now, the loss is going to be the tf.nn.nce loss and uh, the weights for the NCE are going to be the NC weight that we just defined. Biases are NC bias. The labels, and again, out here to just follow through the code, it's important to just focus on one target. So the, the center word that we were thinking of, let's look at the label that is provided for that as part of the input. And let's just say that there is one target. And the input, uh, is going to be embed. So this is the input for that center one center word that we found. We put that input in. This is the target word. The num sampled is the number of negative samples that this 
NC loss is going to sample and the num class is the vocabulary size. So what's going to happen out here is that we have one word, one uh, center word, which is this embed uh, word vector. We have one correct label for it, which is that target word. And now, so that is the positive example in the NCE law. So remember, what NCE does is it, re it creates this proxy uh, binary classification problem to get around the whole complexity of solving the softmax. So out here, what it will do is it will have that one positive example and it will create num sampled, which I think was 64. It will create 64 negative samples. So this is class, uh, the target word and the uh, embed that will create the class one and all the other negative 64 negative examples are going to be of class zero. And uh, we are going to be learning a binary classification to try and separate these, these things out, this one and separate it from the 64. And this is all happening for each of the words. So we started with that one center word, we were focusing on that. And for that, there are 64, we'll be learning the binary classifier and the only thing it's going to be pushing the weights for if you think about it the input out here the only input that it is looking at is embed which is the word vector for that one word we are talking about so when tensorflow auto differentiation happens and it's going to be moving the weights around it's going to move around the weight for just that one center word <laughs> vector and obviously there is this batch size so for the 128 other words that's happening in parallel and all that is happening for just one step, okay? And then we keep on repeating that multiple, multiple times. So this is what is happening. And uh, we, the rest is basically very simple we define the optimizer out here, we minimize the loss, uh, create a session, initialize all the variables, tf.global variables initializer, we create the summary file writer to write all our uh, events for TensorBoard, and then we start looping for the number of training steps. We get one batch, centers and targets, and uh, we run the loss, we run this NC loss function, we run the, we get the loss, we are optimizing, running the optimizer op, feeding in the center words and the target words, and we keep on doing that. So by the end of our num steps, we will have our embed matrix, which is going to get uh, pushed around to to give us the correct word vectors so by the end of it we will have uh, this embed matrix which is the tf variable and uh, nce the nce loss is going to like update the numbers out here in this matrix all the vectors and uh, by once we are done with the training, we will have the word vectors that uh, we need for some downstream task. That concludes lecture four. To finally summarize, we learned about word vectors. We learned about noise contrastive estimation. We learned about embedding matrices. We learned about TSNE, which is a, a dimensionality reduction method, which we use for visualizing word vectors. And um, in lecture five, we are going to be moving on to how to manage our different programs and different experiments that we run while building our models.